Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Sorry for the delay for being a little bit late, but we are going to get started here in a little bit. So it's webinar 13 and we're talking about planning and coordinating community events. So this one's gonna be a little bit different because normally we talk about social media and media relations and pitching um, and style guides and all of everything that's usually just digital. Um, but we're actually gonna talk about planning and coordinating an actual community event this time. Uh, so this is gonna be a little bit different, um, but we're also gonna provide you with one of the basics, which is kind of what I'll talk about, the basics of planning an event. Um, so wh whether that's um, trying to decide what you want your event to be about and um, owning in on the actual purpose of your event, um, talking about volunteers, um, bringing together a budget, narrowing down on a location, uh, all of those really um, basic things that you should have all laid out as you go into planning your event. Um, and then we'll talk about publicity for your event. So kind of how um, our take on how promoting your event, um, the different practices that you can do, the best ways to get your event out there, um, and talking about social media and pitching, um, and different things that you can practice to get people to attend your event in the first place. Um, so I'll talk about the basics. Like I said, all that jazz about location and budget. Um, and then Tanya will take over in the second half and she'll talk about publicity for your event and best practices for that. So let's get started. Um, as you know, when you tune in, if you want to comment to the right of the screen on the chat box with your name, um, the school that you're presenting, um, and then your title, so whether you're the principal or if you're a secretary or someone that is attending on the behalf, um, feel free to type in your name and your position. Um, and then if you have questions along the way for the presentation, we always encourage you to drop those in as we're presenting, that way you don't forget. Um, and we'll always answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Or if you don't wanna make your comment or question public, we always encourage you to send us an email after um, with your name and what school you're from and your question. We'll be happy to send you a reply and any information that we can provide you with. So let's get started. I'm gonna pull up this presentation and we will get going. Just a few minutes. Okay. Okay, here we go. So coordinating and planning community events. Um, so that's actually um, one of the services that we provide is outreach to the community and we can assist in that area. Um, and so we all know that hosting and planning a community event is not the easiest task, um, but it's very rewarding and very fruitful in doing that because it gives you the opportunity to be um, right in front of your audience that you're trying to connect with um, and you can reap a lot of benefits. So speaking to schools specifically, you can host an event to a particular community or neighborhood that you're trying to impact um, to reel in more prospective students, um, to get in contact with the parents within that neighborhood or that particular zip code, um, or even connect with your current audience. Um, and that might be just to get to know them better, to have that more personal feel with them, um, or even to raise funds for your school. So community events can be um, something that's very fruitful for a lot of different reasons, not just for having a, an event for the sake of having an event. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that you can do, uh, specifically for schools. Schools offer so many, many things to begin with, um, so many different activities. There's so many organizations within your schools. I can imagine, I'm sure that there's um, book club and um, soccer organizations and um, math club. You know, there might be a ton of different organizations that students can be a part of. So even hosting an event for them, maybe to raise funds to send them to a camp or a competition or something like that, you can use events to raise money for them. Um, or you can use events, like I said, to get in contact or connect with an audience that is outside of your audience currently. Maybe you want to branch out to a zip different zip code um, or branch out to a particular neighborhood that you really want um, to reel in prospective parents or students. There's a lot of different things that you can do um, that deal with events particularly. So let's get started with the first. So guidelines for planning. Um, so like I said, community events are a great way to build a relationship with your local community and groups of parents or prospects. 
Um, so what is the why? So from the very beginning, um, and I might use this as an example throughout our presentation. So we're actually planning one of our own events. Um, and so from the very beginning, we had to ask ourselves and our team, um, what is the why of our event? Because if you don't really understand the why, why you're doing it in the first place, um, it's going to be very muddy and it's not going to be very clear as you begin promoting your event, as you begin executing it and putting it all together. So you want to really truly understand why you're hosting your event to begin with. Um, and then it's important as you go forward because you're going to need a team, you're going to need a um, or an organization, a committee that's planning with you um, to help you pull off the event because it's, you know, depending on the size of the event, it can be a lot more uh, to do than just one person can really handle. Um, and so from there, it's really important for you to be open about what you're hoping to accomplish from that event and being transparent with them because that helps your team to trust you um, and it helps them to find the reason why they want to participate in that event and planning the event to begin with. So like I said, there's a lot of different reasons why you might want to host a community event. Um, like I said, it could be raising money for a specific organization within your school, or maybe it's a student club or um, a sports team, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you might want to raise money for them. You can create a lasting event within the community that might be um, an, an annual event from there on forward that um, that your community is going to remember you by. And so that's establishing your presence within them. Um, it might be to imp impact a particular audience and develop a relationship with them. There's a lot of different reasons why you might want to, you know, host event, an event to begin with. Um, and so other things that you can explore too, just to give you an example. So maybe you are considering hosting an event, but you're not entirely sure how to do it. Um, your goals might vary from being educational or they might be um, to motivate your community. Um, if your goal is to educate, um, you might consider doing a debate or a panel discussion, something that's really engaging. That might be a great way to um, impact the parents within your community. If you really wanna educate them on a particular topic, that might be concerning students or might be concerning um, learning styles of students. It could vary, but um, if your goal, bottom line, is to educate, you can consider hosting those types of events. Um, you could even try having a single focus speaker um, or a video, something that motivates your audience, um, whatever it may be. Those are different types of events that you can have that reel in your parents um, or even reel in the students, whatever for whatever particular topic you're hoping um, to have that speaker speak about. Um, you could even have more creative events. So maybe your school is into hosting a carnival or um, some type of annual event during the fall, maybe a fall fest or um, a summer kickoff to raise funds. Um, those are different types of events that you can host. Um, and another thing that you can consider, which many don't, but you can consider co-hosting an event. So if there's a specific organization who um, has the same focus as you do, you always want to do your research and ensure that they have the same values and goals that align with your school um, because you don't want to partner with an organization that you may not agree with later or that you may associate yourself with and later find out that you don't agree with their values or um, what they're trying to achieve. But if you do have an organization that clearly aligns with your goals and what you're hoping to accomplish or raise money for or educate, um, it can be of your benefit to collaborate with these organizations because it provides a bigger pool for resources and it also gives you the opportunity to reel in a larger attendance um, because they're also able to publicize to their community and their large group of followers. Um, it can also bring a lot, a good group of diverse or diversity within your group. Um, if you collaborate with these other types of organizations, um, and it also just helps to build relations, relationships too with other organizations because you might find later on down the line that they might have an organization that they partner with frequently and they could recommend you to them. Um, and so just having that co-sponsor, having that co-host, um, can be of your benefit, especially if they have that same vision um, that aligns with yours. Um, so those are just a different uh, or a good way to start off the event planning process. It's just understanding why you're hosting your event to begin with, 
And once you have that boiled down to, which Tanya will go a little bit further into detail as we talk about um, sending out your message to the media, why it's so important for that to be very concrete, um, you'll understand um, why having that why to begin with is so important. And we'll go into our next slide, which is creating a budget. So I know that most schools kind of already understand the importance of this. Um, that's just a simple quote that I found that demonstrates how important budgeting is. Um, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. Um, so sorting out your budget from the very beginning is extremely important because there can be surprise expenses that can come up. Um, and so it's always really good to do your research and be very detailed um, and think of every possible thing that you might need to buy or every possible expense that could come up. That way you're not left um, stuck in a messy situation as you're planning your event. Um, so if you create your own budget, these are on the screen are just a few examples of budget items that, um, that I found could be useful to include within your budget. So track um, site rental cost, um, catering, transportation, decor, all those are just very simple um, line items that you can add to your budget. Um, but you wanna be able to break down every single item in your math budget that you create um, line by line. So you don't wanna just lump things together because that can get really confusing and you will not know what you're saving money essentially for. Um, so you wanna, create individual items for your event budget and break it down as neatly as you can. Um, like for example, in food, don't just put food as one line item, but if you need food for a particular area, maybe it's a different booth, maybe it's breakfast, maybe it's um, snacks for your volunteers, all those different types of things should be broken down or broke down um, as uh, organized and as as you can, break it down as much as you can. Um, it can cause planning issues later on down the line if you don't look at it that way. So you wanna be sure that your money is as detailed as possible within your budget. Um, after that, once you've created the, that detailed description, it's really good, or detailed line items, it's really good to incorporate a description. Um, and it's extremely necessary for your event budget to begin with. So. If there's um, an extra column that you'll add, um, that can include that you know maybe that particular expense needs to be approved by someone, or that particular expense needs to come from a particular vendor because you've worked with them year over year. Um, whatever description that you feel is essential, um, you want to add that in. Don't make it super cluttered and add non-essential information. That way, it's easily readable by whatever organization or whatever group or whatever parent you might have. Um, managing this particular part of the event. Um, but having, adding a description can provide a lot of clarity on what is needed and what is a must have as you move forward. Um, then you can also add another column for amounts needed, such as quantities or um, tracking how much you'll need as you go through your planning process. Um, and that's another important column to add. Um, you can also add actual costs or estimated costs. Those are other two different columns that you can add to ensure that your budget stays on track um, throughout the planning process. Um, once, you, once you have a really good um, budget prepared, um, now, it's, now it's time to focus on actually getting to um, purchasing the product. So you might look out to past events that you've put on um, and reach out to those vendors that you might have worked with in the past, um, calling those vendors and getting the, uh, the quickest or the correct price isn't always the quickest process to do, um, but it gives you that realistic estimate of cost. That way you never go over your budget. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that you might include that you don't normally think about when reaching out to vendors, but there's gratuities and service fees or taxes and whatever that might be. And so including that within your budget to begin with can save you a lot in the end. Um, certain things to think about as you create your budget, um, let's say you're bringing in a speaker, speakers can sometimes either charge or they'll do it um, for benefit. Um, but if you're bringing in a well-known speaker, they'll normally have a writer that's attached to them and that will include their speaker costs and their traveling fees, um, other things that they require as they attend an event. Um, so including that within your budget as well 
just in case can be helpful. Or maybe you're bringing in um, entertainment for a school event. So even if you're hosting um, a cover band or something that, that provides some type of entertainment, if you think about it or if you think that they might have a writer, it's always best to ask rather than to have it sent to you later on down the line and not expect it. Um, so that, that can be one that you can consider for your budget line. Um, consider food and beverage, consider uh, decor like I have it right here. Um, gifts for your volunteers, that's also a really good one that most don't remember, but if you have a group of volunteers or parents that's helping you plan the event, you always wanna be able to provide them with something in the end. So that might be an actual physical gift um, or it might be a dinner or a lunch that you um, take them to, whatever it might be to, to say thank you and then is really important. Um, it's also important to look at AV. So if you're renting a place, usually there is an AV cost that's associate, associated with it, excuse me. Um, or if you're hosting it at your school, that can always save you uh, a lot of money to begin with. Um, but there might be AV costs, um, venue rentals. Like I said, if you're renting a space, um, you might need to rent out different parts of whatever your venue is. If it's a larger ballroom, if it's a smaller breakout room, um, be prepared to deal with other costs such as AV or Wi-Fi or on-site support, um, whatever that might be. Um, it's important also to include not just the, the literal expenses that come with hosting an event like transportation or decor, entertainment, um, but costs that will be um, accrued during promotion of your event. So marketing costs, um, there might be a budget that you could set aside for Facebook ads um, or even giveaways, um, which is something that you can also use as you begin to promote your event, which I'm sure Tanya will talk about also, but using giveaways to entice your audience to attend your event um, is also something that you should consider as you create your budget for your event. Um, there also might be contest prizes um, or even just traditional marketing costs that might be associated with promoting your event. It's important to think about those things as you move forward. Um, another thing that you can consider, um, you might be able to get this as um, or from a volunteer, which is something that we'll also talk about later on um, as I finish up the first part. Um, but video production and photography, you might have a videographer or a photographer for your event, um, which is always really great to have because not only do you wanna have those photos of your inaugural event, if it is the first event that you're having, but you can re reuse those photos um, for the next event that you host um, or the if you have it, if it becomes an annual event, you can use those photos to help promote your event on social media posts or on your website, um, whatever it might be, it's always really good to include that um, within your within your cost. Mm. And then another thing that might not be, or that you might not think about is just cost of internet. So again, if you're renting a venue, um, usually there is an internet cost. It doesn't just come free with the space, but it, you might need Wi-Fi coverage. Um, and so including that into your budget will save you um, in the end. Uh, next is relay your message. So if you want um, people to buy a ticket, um, it's important to be very clear within your message as you relay this out to them. So you wanna consider every aspect of your community and demographic um, and consider how to best contact them. Um, that will be also be something that Tanya will go a little bit into detail as far as how to connect with your community, how to connect with your audience using social media and using publicity, um, how to entice your audience to attend your event. Um, and so as you move forward, uh, location is also a really big um, part of your event because it's going to work hand in hand as far as who you invite you to your event to begin with. Um, so choosing a location can boil down to a number of different things. Um, it can boil down to who you'd like to attend your event um, or even the envir environment that you would like to create as you host your event. So maybe you're trying to reach out to a particular neighborhood um, or a zip code um, and you know that that particular zip code is very family friendly. Um, they love events that um, they can bring their kids to. Um, they love things that are educational, things that empower their kids to learn and to grow. Um, and if you know that that's the culture of that neighborhood and maybe your school isn't within that neighborhood to begin with, it's not 
in that location, it's a little bit further away, you might consider hosting something at their local library. Something that you know that parents are paying attention to, that they visit weekly, that they're constantly monitoring those bulletin boards and staying in touch with what events that library is hosting and you're hoping to connect with those, and then it's important to consider how that location is gonna be of benefit to you because you know that your those parents are going to, to see that, that event that you're hosting. Um, so um, you might also wanna consider various groups um, or individuals. If you're inviting um, the public to your event, so if it's an open event that's not just open to your school um, or solely to your school, you want to consider different things. Um, like I said, if it's family friendly or race or religion, whatever it might be, you want to consider that too as you're looking um, into choosing your location. Um, if you're inviting public officials, which also can be a really good way to um, entice other audience members to join or to um, connect with a different audience maybe, inviting a public official to your event um, can be a great benefit for you. So say, for example, you're inviting the mayor or councilman or um, whoever it might be, if you choose a location that um, is somewhere that they most likely will not want to be seen, it won't work in your favor. So you want to be cognizant of that. I mean, if you're inviting someone um, of that status or um, who is a public official, be you want to ensure that that location is a place where he or she can be seen at and is okay with being seen at. Um, so those are just a, on the screen are a different or a few different examples of places that you could have your event at. Like I said, a local library or a community center say that you want to have um, an event that empowers health and fitness and you want to um, exert how your school's PE program or sports programs um, really own in on staying healthy and promoting fitness and you want to deliver that to that specific community, you might consider hosting an event at their local YMCA or their community center. Um, that way they're able to visit and then they have more of a chance to attend because they're familiar with that place. Um, you can also use room rooms available at your church or at your school, which I'm sure a lot of you already use um, currently. Um, and so continue to use those, of course, if they work within your favor um, or even consider hosting events, learning events at different places, maybe university campuses or um, coffee shops or restaurants. There's a, a lot of different places that you can host events at. Um, but choosing the location that's perfect for you um, and perfect for your audience is extremely important. Um, and always ask yourself, where do people within your community or your target audience already gather? Um, and so choosing a handful or maybe two to three different locations that you know that they gather at um, and then breaking the, each of those down and trying to find the best one that will bring you the most visibility is really important and will pay off in the end. Um, and so be cognizant of where your community is already located or your target audience. Um, you also wanna find a space that's big enough to begin with for your guest. Um, so if you have an idea of how many guests you plan to invite, you wanna ensure that it is going to be large enough and not um, not try to eyeball it or think that, well, it may be large enough or it might be a little bit tight. You want to ensure that it will be large enough and um, that it's going to be able to house every single one of your attendees that, that is there. Um, other factors that you want to include as you're choosing a location include parking. That's really important. Um, usually it's really hard to bring an audience to a place where parking is not as accessible. Um, or if, you know, the place that you choose does not have available parking or has paid parking, then just know that you're gonna have to work through that much harder to reel in your audience to attend your event because that is one other factor that they're gonna have to include when they attend your event. Um, so in include parking um, in the back of your mind as you're looking for a, an event or in this, uh, when you're looking for a venue. Um, consider wheelchair accessibility. That's important. Um, AV access, internet, um, and access to public transportation, especially especially if you're making this a public event um, and free and open to the public, it's important to have that. Um, recruiting, we'll talk right now about recruiting, volunteers. It's really important to have volunteers assist you as you're planning your event because um, hosting an event is really not something that you can just do on your own. 
um, it, it's a really big job and it comes with a lot of different um, just facets that um, that will take a lot of time as far as the planning process and even putting the event on to begin with. Um, and so the number of volunteers that you have for your event is really going to depend on the size of your event. Um, and so it, it's okay for you to relay off those tasks or um, hand off a department to your volunteers and create a team that can manage um, and work with you to plan this event. Um, so those are just a few example areas that you can have volunteers assist you. So set up and clean up are, of course, extremely important. Um, grieving a registration, it's always important to have a, a team of volunteers help you to do that because nine times out of ten, you're not going to be available for that. Um, or you and the other person who's helping you run the event are not going to be available. So you need a team that's able um, to do that for you and that you can trust and ensure that everybody is checked in and registered um, technical setup. Sometimes, if you rent a venue, you're going to need you're going to have to pay for that service. Um, but if you have a team of volunteers, you can do that for you. That saves you the cost. Um, this is also something I was referencing earlier: photography. Sometimes you can get away with having a volunteer do that. Um, if you have someone within your community, maybe it's a parent or a student who is. Um, someone familiar with photography or experience, you can get away with having them volunteer to um, capture your event. Um, so it's just important to be aware of how planning an event and hosting an event takes just a lot of time and a lot of energy. And so you will need volunteers to ensure that it runs smoothly. Um, and the number of volunteers usually depends on that size of your event or the size of your event. Um, other areas that your volunteers that you can have volunteers lead include publicity. So you might have somebody within your community who is familiar with PR, or maybe has that connection um, or has those connections with fellow reporters um, or producers. If you have someone in your community who can offer that for you, um, then it's really important to take advantage of that because they'll be able to um, send your message out to the media um, because they already have that relationship. Um, so different tasks that you can have, which we'll talk a little bit more on the publicity side, is just um, leading your social media, um, managing your media relations, um, sending out those emails, e email pitches to media um, leading up to the event. All those different things are, are things to take advantage of if someone you have is familiar with public relations. Um, like I said, set up and clean up. Of course, there's always going to be tables and chairs or um different parts of your venue to set up food to arrange or copies to make or um, name tags. There's a lot of different aspects to logistics of your event that you'll need. Um, and having a good group of volunteers to help you do that is really important. Um, like I also said, greeting and registration, um, all these different parts of um, the event are important for your volunteers to lead because it leaves you with um, more free hands to do other things and to manage and to monitor the event as it runs. Um, and so as you go through this event planning process, it's important to keep your volunteers on tasks. Um, and so you might set up monthly or weekly check-ins um, to ensure that each task is being completed, um, which is helpful. You could also use maybe an online system. I know there's a lot of different programs out there such as Slack um, or Trello that are free that you can um, assign different tasks. They have an email, they can create an account and you can use that as a virtual checklist for them. That way you can monitor what they're working on currently, what they've accomplished already um, and what they're working on um, after. And you can assign different tasks that way also. Um, and so having that monthly or weekly check-in point with them is to help you ensure that each task is being completed. Um, you might also consider having in-person meetings um, monthly or having a few right before the event to ensure that each volunteer is on task, um, that they're ready um, and prepared and knowledgeable about the event. That way, if they're asked questions or um, they might have an attendee who needs help on a particular thing or um, they're able to answer those questions and that they seem knowledgeable and um, understand the event fully. Mm. 
And then at the end of the event, like I said, it's important as you include that within your budget, but it's really important to um, be sure to say thank you at the end of the event to your volunteers um, in the form of, like I said, a luncheon or a dinner or a gift. Just having that extra gesture helps them to feel appreciated and acknowledged um, and most likely they will volunteer for you in the future. Um, so always be sure to be sympathetic with your volunteers, especially if they are um, confused or not entirely sure um, what they're supposed to be doing, maybe in the area that they're leading or assisting in. As long as you have that sympathy within them, they are more likely to help you with um, future events. Um, so those are a few of the logistical areas that you can practice as you set up your event. Um, one thing that I want to go back to, speaking to locate or location, um, a few things that I missed. Um, if you consider hosting um, a larger event that needs to be outdoors, of course, hosting it on your school campus or hosting it um, at a larger event venue. Um, let's say that, for example, if you're hosting it, uh, if you're hosting a carnival or or something of that nature. Um, to re bring in money for your school. Um, but it's also important to consider branching out and just finding more creative ways. Um, nowadays, it's so much easier um, to host movies on the lawn um, or hosting, um, maybe it's an educational event. Um, try to use that to access different um, audiences within your community. And so doing that research, like I said, ahead of time, say you're, trying to reach um, parents who have more interest in science um, or wanting their students or their child to really focus on that. Um, and so doing a lot of research ahead of time is also gonna help you impact the choice of your location. Um, so um, say you're doing something more educational or you wanna own in on um, Catholic schools and how they are very, um, how they capitalize on college education and college acceptance um, and how majority of their students, of your students at your particular school get accepted. And say so you wanna showcase that to that particular parent group or that particular community. Um, do your research as far as what group um, also has that same value as you do. Um, and then do your research as far as what schools or universities, maybe it's a local university that they really enjoy their particular science program or math program or whatever program it might be that, um, that you can um, give assurance that that's something that your school focuses on as well, um, then consider hosting an event at that campus or in that classroom um, or student center, whatever it might be that gives your audience an enticing value to visit that school to begin with. Um, and then it also gives you um, the benefit of them knowing that that you want their child to attend college and to be accepted to that program and to receive scholarships within that program as well. Um, and show it, it shows them that you have that tie to that university or that particular um, organization or program to begin with. Um, it also doesn't have to be something as large as, as that nature. If you don't feel comfortable hosting at a university um, or something that large, you can always look for something smaller such as a local club, um, or a meeting space within your local library or your local community area. Um, but try to do your research as far as maybe there's community centers within your neighborhood, within that neighborhood or within that particular zip code that parents constantly meet at. Um, because most parents who um, are keeping their eye open for their student to find different organizations that they can participate in um, are keeping their eyes open for those bulletins and boards and keep their eyes open at those community centers to find what events are coming there. Um, and so if you can really um, develop a connection with that particular place uh, or the person who plans the events for that venue, um, then you're more likely to also um, be able to connect with that particular parent group or organization um, or neighborhood. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that, that come into play whenever you're discussing logistics. Um, and so finding a location, um, knowing your brand and consider co-hosting, um, dealing down and finding the correct budget, um, being very specific with that. Those are all just a few different items that come with the logistic part of planning your event. Um, and we know that there's a number of you at 
Catholic schools um, that do host events annually um, or even quarterly that have um, that know some of this already. But if you ever have a question about planning logistics or the easiest way to do something, you can always you know let us know if you have a question, and we'd always be glad and happy to help you um, for both the logistics side and publicity for your event. Um, and so. Moving forward now as we go on, we're going to talk about publicity and I'm going to turn it over to Tanya now and she's going to give you um, some good information about, about branding, um, using social media to your advantage and optimizing your website and SEO to help you move forward in this. I'm going to turn it over to her. All right. So as Jane Russell once said, <laughs> publicity can be terrible, but only if you don't have any. So what's important in that aspect and that of when you're creating community events is that if you want, if you're having an event, no matter what type and you want humans to attend it, uh, the best thing you can do is put forth effort to gain publicity so that people can know and hear about it. Um, this is important. It's not to brag or say, hey, look at me, look what I'm doing, but rather to give your target audience the knowledge that something is happening, to invite them uh, or to share it with the public. Even if someone who sees it, uh, who may not be in your target audience um, and may not be interested in the event, it's likely that they'll know at least one person who is and they'll be able to share that information with them. And why did they share it? Because they saw something that was on TV or online, heard something on the radio, um, read about it in a magazine. Wherever you feel like the publicity would work best and where you feel like your audience may be consuming media, that's a good place to start when it comes to seeking publicity. Um, on the other hand, there are critical elements to consider when you're planning for publicity so that you're not just blanketing the general public. Uh, it's also important that um, to think about where you want to spend your time um, so that you're not showcasing your event and putting forth energy into to channels and different avenues and um, publicity efforts that won't make sense for advertising, marketing, and PR. You have to think about things like who is your event serving? Uh, what is the goal for your event, which Victoria talked a lot about, determining your why. Um, what's your event attendance goal. So if you're hosting something, uh, again, as Victoria suggested, at a, perhaps at a public library or in a classroom, um, you're not gonna necessarily need 400 people to fill the event to capacity. You may be looking at more of a niche audience of uh, between 20 and 40 people. And you may want to focus on one really valiant media effort um, as opposed to trying to get on every single lifestyle show in the city. Um, one other thing you want to think about is who you need talking about the event. So once more, just because uh, the individuals that you hit may or it, in the case that they may not be interested in the event, are they influencers of um, other people who may be interested? So are you marketing to or publicizing to parents of children who you want to be at an event? Um, or perhaps your current um, students, parents, so that they can help to share the information with uh, prospective future parents of students. Um, When you're thinking about how you want to disseminate the information and spread your message, uh, you'll want to consider what your brand is. This goes hand in hand with what your why is, and it's a really important thing to consider as you're creating that message. Um, your school brand and the brand of your events should align with one another. These are things that they're not things that you can make up as you go. Uh, you need to have a plan in place. Um, you should probably already understand what your brand is. 
for your school um, or in any case, whatever company or entity you're representing. Um, it's something that you've likely already established. Um, if it's not, consider a plan to really develop the personality of your brand. Uh, it's not only about who you are in a sentence, but what colors uh, do people identify with you? Um, what words, what keywords and key phrases um, can people associate with, with what your brand is and who the school is? What adjectives would be used to describe you? Um, if you were, if the brand or the school was a person, how would their best friend describe them in just a few words? Um, and then what messages are you trying to disseminate? What are your key messages? What things do you want people to know about you? If they had three bullet points to give, um, what three bullet points would be most important to you? You can think about this for each one of your events as well. So again, it should align and go hand in hand with the brand of your school because that's ultimately what it's representing. But each event may have a little bit of a different brand, um, depending on if you have a theme for the event, if it's a fundraiser, if it's an educational event, if it's a religious event, um, it will rely on the type of the event and um, the ambiance, those kind of things. So each one will vary a little bit. So you'll want to establish a brand for each one, really know what it is and be able to speak to it. So to set the tone and the brand for your events, consider a few questions. Uh, one, what is the event? Are we doing something that's a fundraiser where we're trying to make some money? A family event where you're trying to bring out all of the, the schools, families together. Um, perhaps it's a sporting event or uh, while they all align with being religious events, more specifically a um, one that's held in the church. Why should anyone want to attend the event? So again, speaking a little bit more back to the goal, but um, having a more overarching purpose. Are you trying to educate? Are you trying to entertain? Are you trying to get someone to be called to action? Is it something that's action oriented? And at the end of the event, you want them to do something um, for you or for the school or for their kids um, or for the community? Is it something where you're hosting an event just to have, um, allow others to spend quality time with one another? Or is it something that people should attend out of necessity? Um, Maybe it's a, a introduction to a new school or a new program and it's a mandatory attendance if someone's interested in being a part of it. So that may be something that's out of necessity and you'll need to brand it a little bit differently than you would for something that's a bit more casual. Uh, and then think about who should attend the event. Are you looking for prospects to attend? Is it an event for teachers and faculty? Um, is it for the general public just to provide more information about something you're doing? Are we targeting parents or is it the students that we're most interested in? Uh, think uh, You want to know what speaks to your audience as well. So depending on who your target audience is, it'll require an understanding of your knowledge of, of how to speak and communicate with them. Um, are you trying to reach baby boomers, millennials, Generation Z? Um, should you be using a casual vocabulary or a more professional high level vocabulary? Sometimes in these days we can use hashtags and acronyms and things like that that are much more like you're texting someone than you're having a um, full blown conversation with them. But often that's what helps to connect us with a younger audience when we're using the kind of verbiage that they text with and that they Snapchat each other with. So if you're really looking to um, connect with someone on that level of where they are, make sure that you're using the language that they speak.
Um, when you're thinking about photos to use, you want to, ma again, match who you're trying to relate it to. So if it's something that you're interested in uh, getting, if it's a more female predominant audience that you want to reach, maybe with the photos that you use, you can use some photos of moms or ladies smiling at the camera or um, women engaged in conversation. If you're wanting to reach parents, you can either use pictures of folks who are your current students' parents, uh, folks who look like them, it may be a stock image, um, or maybe use pictures of their kids. Everyone wants to see pictures of um, pets and kids all the time, and even better if it's their own pets or their own kids, because they feel a little bit of that uh, 15 minutes of fame and um, are able to have that connection, a stronger connection to what you're promoting. Um, and then the color scheme. Colors are an important thing to think about. Um, there aren't necessarily some colors that work better than others. It just depends what you're trying to portray. Uh, for example, I'm gonna use one that is on two very different sides of the spectrum. Um, red can be perceived as a danger sign or alert, so we think about a stop sign, um, right? On the other hand, red is also a very bold color that's used to express excitement or something that we're really passionate about. Um, it's often used in, in different logos, and it's it's not to say that every time we see red, we're we know we're in danger, but. Um, we just want to think about the, the different things that it could portray. So if you're typically using a, a blue or green color stream scheme and then you throw red in, um, it may throw some people off because it doesn't really follow the brand and suit. Um, and just to give some other explanations of from different research studies that have been done of um, and psychological effects of colors, orange is often connected to um, being fresh, youthful, adventurous, and creative. Yellow uh, brings out optimism, cheerfulness, and playfulness. Green um, shows vitality, prestige, and wealth. Of course, we're going to relate green to money oftentimes, but it's also a really uh, lively color that is often used. And it, of course, these can change depending upon the variant of that color that you're using. And then blue is trustworthy and calming and can also be seen because of maybe cloudy days. A gray blue may be seen as a little um, less than thrilling. So just be aware of what colors you're using. Make sure it follows the brand that you already have or at least um, aligns with it nicely so that it's not something that's just totally on the other side of the spectrum from what people are typically used to seeing from you if, if in fact, that brand has um, brought upon a really positive response. So colors matter, but what you say and show with those colors will matter as well. Um, what photos you're using matter in combination with the colors. Make sure that photos you use, people are making eye, eye contact with the camera. So that, again, the, the folks looking at it feel connected. The, they're front facing, they're engaged and happy. Um, if you have great ones of your students or teachers, definitely use them. Otherwise, you can consider using stock images. There are plenty of free stock images that you can use to make sure that you spruce up your, um, your flyers for your event, your website for your event, anything that you're using for collateral, um, that it comes out nicely. So create a brand for your event that represents you, but also represents the theme of your event. So the next thing that's crucial is your event website. Um, you can do this in a lot of different ways. You can integrate it into your current school website. You can create an Eventbrite page. Um, you can uh, create a standalone WordPress site um, that's just simple and basic and maybe includes a few different uh, elements of what to expect at the event. 
Um, get the most out of your event website with SEO, that search engine optimization, and it helps. Essentially, what it's doing is providing you the opportunity to get higher up on Google's rankings. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, it really is about generating good content over time. If you're just creating a an event page on social media, that is a definitely an option um, that you can utilize as long as you have all the information there. Uh, Facebook ranks even better than any organic website. So for example, if we had our agency's website, there is there has been many times where our Facebook page has ranked better than our um, typical URL, samsochoa.com, because of all of the content that we're putting on social media, the frequency with which we put it, and the consistency of the keywords that we use. Um, so if you are doing a website, a separate website, um, or even one that's integrated into your page, blogging is one way that you can help to improve um, good content that's built over time for your SEO. Uh, constant new content will help to rank um, your website on a higher level and higher up on those Google charts. You can write about anything relevant to your event. Um, you may talk about other events that are happening that lead up to your event that people may want to go to if there's a series of events. Um, you can post about uh, maybe an educational piece or someone who will be a part of the event, different elements that you're showcasing. Do a spotlight of the band that's going to be playing. You can blog about so many different topics um, or pieces of your event. If you're starting, let's say you're starting planning six months in advance, um, we'd recommend doing weekly blogging. So that's only 24 different topics you have to come up with. And uh, again, they can be about any number of topics and they don't have to be long. So it could be something that's as short as two or 300 words, but up to about seven to 800 because you don't want to lose your reader. Um, keywords are another significant part of SEO. You want to pick a good solid number of at least five keywords or phrases that are relevant to what your event is about. Use them in URLs. You can use them in your blogs. You can use them in descriptions on other pages where you post about the event, on any calendar listings. Be consistent across the board with any keywords or phrases phrases that you use and make sure that they're relevant to your event. So if you're hosting an event that's a fundraiser um, for tuition assistance, you want to use that tuition assist assistance keyword many times. You also want to use something like San Antonio fundraiser so people know it's in San Antonio and they know what the purpose of the event is. If there's a theme that you have um, that you want Think about whatever the, the theme may be, if it's uh, technology, the progression of technology in Catholic schools or your event has something to do with that or you're raising funds for um, computer technology, be sure to include phrases like those um, within your keywords. Backlinks will also serve you well. If you have sponsors or partners at your event, make sure you're um, putting their links, their website links on your page. Um, and on your event website and in your social media and ask that they do the same for you. So provide them with that link and ask them to, to post it on their website. Um, be sure to include your links to the event website on any social media listings. Anytime you're commenting on people asking about it, if you're in a Facebook group, um, use that URL, use those keywords over and over again. And now enters our social media marketing. Because of the massive reach opportunity of social media, this is the best place that you can market your event. Um, though there are many other important pieces, so don't rely solely on social media. Um, think about all the things that Victoria shared in your progression of planning the community event um, or program, and uh, just consider other opportunities you have to share. Social media is not the only place, but it may well be the most important. Um, whatever your audience is, they're on social media. You're on it right now watching this. Um, 
The statistics, as you can see in front of you, show how widely it's used. On the lower end of the spectrum, 35% of 55 to 64 year olds are consistently engaging in social media. Uh, as we continue to expand the age, 95% um, of 18 to 34 year olds are, are using it. So you can see that percentage continue to grow. Um, these numbers are continuing to grow by the day. Uh, and are probably higher on, you know, certain demographics, certain age groups are higher on other social platforms than others, on some social platforms more than others. And I'll explain um, a little bit about how to select social plat uh, social media platforms now. Um, so when you're thinking about where you want to publicize, you should be spending the most time on marketing your event. You want to look at um, analytics. So dig into analytics on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever social media platform you're using, and look at who your audience is. So each one of these platforms can show you that. Uh, if you watched our past um, presentation webinar on Facebook ads, uh, we talked a little bit about exactly where you can find the analytics and how you can look at the age group and demographics and location of the people who you are communicating with in your audience on social media every single day. Uh, Twitter and Instagram do the same thing. You can also use uh, platforms like Hootsuite or TweetDeck or Sprout Social uh, in order to look further into those analytics. They'll show you exactly the percentage of how many female to male um, the breakdown of age groups that you have, exactly what cities they're from. So it's really telling information and it will help you to market and to spend the most time on the place where your, uh, the place where your audience will be. Um, Facebook is usually a great one to focus on first um, because of the ability to create event calendar invites where you can provide information, education, links to tickets, and even more than that, all on your page without clicking through to anywhere else. Facebook works very hard to always keep its user engaged on its website, so has made the platform really user-friendly as far as um, being able to do it in all one swoop and not having to go anywhere else to for any event or communication needs. Um, it's not to say that you shouldn't use something like Twitter or Instagram, often because of the visual nature of Instagram. If you're hosting an event involving something like food, people will be more drawn to the pictures of delicious food than a bunch of text written about a hamburger. You wanna see the burger, you don't wanna read about it. Um, you just have to be cognizant of where you're getting the most engagement. So if you're making the same post across the board on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and one or two of them are getting way more engagement than the others, perhaps you should post on the third best performer only once a week, and the other two who are performing better with engagement, maybe up to two to three times a week, so you can keep informing and sharing where people are most interested. Because if you keep posting links and sharing information about the event over and over again, and no one's responding to it, you're not really communicating with them you are now just shouting at them. Figure out where people are talking back to you, talking with you, asking questions, and, and pay more attention to that social platform, but don't ignore the others just because of that. Keep the conversation going. It's not just about posting your link to purchase tickets um, every single day. Uh, it's about showing different elements of the event to draw attendees in. So of current social media content, videos account for 81% of the most engaged posts. So video is a good place to turn when getting people to converse with you about your event because it's just getting more engagement than any other kind of post on social media right now. Um, you can show videos of special guests. Um, you can have them film some of their own if they are quality videos that they can provide. Uh, or you can go and film them talking about their participation in the event. Uh, you can film snippets of a performance, a verbal inv invitation from the keynote speaker to attend, maybe some of the kiddos talking about 
uh, why a fundraiser would be important, what kind of impact it will have on them. Um, images of previous year's events. You can have quotes from past attendees talking about why the event was awesome and amazing and why people would want to attend. Uh, in advance of the event, you should create an editorial calendar so that you know how often uh, you're posting. Um, it should be a timeline, you know, so you know if it's daily, if you're posting two or three times a week, whatever the case may be. It, probably when you're six months out, you, you don't want to post only about the event every single day. You want to alter that with some different content that's about your brand, your organization, things that you're regularly posting on social media, but just start to infiltrate um, posts about the event as soon as the, the data is set and the details are in place. Um, so you can have a, a calendar for six months out, three months out, one month before the event and two weeks before. You may not always be promoting six months away if you're if you're doing something like a special program or an announcement um, or even a smaller scale fundraiser, it, it won't necessarily be something that you want to promote so far in advance so that people don't forget it. Um, the six months out is more so for an annual event or something that um, is going to be, be more grand scale. In addition to plotting out the timeline, you should also create a strategy for the type of con content to the, the point of truly writing the posts out and planning what you're going to um, caption each thing. Uh, you don't have to do it six months of content at a time. You can do a month at a time um, so that there's smaller bites that you can chew. Um, but think about where you want to input videos, who you want content from, and what you can do to be creative and draw people in. Uh, again, refer back to ads, our ads webinar. Um, to get greater detail on how to set those up, but ads are definitely something that you can use to draw and attract people to um, what you want to, or to the event that you're hosting. Um, like Victoria said, it's going to be really important to, to know the why and know your audience. And so you want to target specific things, and Facebook ads and other social media ads allow you to do just that. Um, you can target a specific age, specific gender if you want to, specific interests. You can even retarget. Uh, so if you have a list of um, perhaps prospects that have shown interest in, in uh, enrolling their students at your school, you can enter that uh, or drop that list into the Facebook ad platform and have them retarget to those people specifically. So if you have a list of like 300 prospects, you can put that list into Facebook and into the ad platform and those ads will go specifically to those people so long as their emails are associated with their Facebook page. So it's pretty interesting stuff and um, if you've ever noticed out of nowhere, you get you start seeing the same ads over and over again about something that you talked about or some, some email list you signed up for, then now you know why, because you can retarget. But use that um, in, in any way that you can, any kind of list that you have. You can even uh, retarget from people who fill out information on your website or people who have visited your website. It's called a, a lookalike audience, and you can use that through something called a Facebook pixel. If you want more information on that, just shoot us an email, and we can give you a little bit more detail. It's a, a little bit of a deep dive um, to describe it. So we'll stay a little more high level here. Um, the next thing we want to think about once we have our social media marketing in place is the mainstream media. Um, so it's important to use your knowledge of pitching and storytelling and press release writing. And this is another webinar that we did. So please refer back to that. Uh, if you have not watched it or if you need a refresher on how to pitch um, and how to tell your story, you want to find the most creative stories um, within your event uh, and about your event so that it's not just, uh, hey, this event is happening, but hey, this is why it matters. Um, reach out to media in advance to understand what angles of the event they may be interested in. Um, 
So there are so many different media members and um, their producers. We had anchors and reporters, assignment editors. Um, all of them are going to have a little bit different of an interest or look at things from a little bit of a different angle. Um, you want to reach out, find those allies that you've created or, or look, some, look up some folks who you can reach out to and ask, tell them about your event and ask them what if there's an aspect of it that, that may interest them most. Um, you also have the opportunity to get media involved in an event. If you're having a, a foodie event, then you can have um, them judge. You can get a, a personality, a news personality from every station to judge whatever food items you would like. Um, if you're in, in need of a couple of spokespeople for your event, you can ask a local anchor um, one from one of the major four broadcast networks uh, locally or and then another from one of the two Spanish stations. So you can um, leverage and have a little bit more opportunity if you have a couple of co-hosts instead of just one. Uh, it's likely that if they're invested in the event and they care about what it's about, um, that they'll also be interested in covering it. Finally, you want to pitch to lifestyle shows. Um, pick the ones that are the best fit. So we have a number of them. Uh, we, again, we talk about them in that, that pitching webinar. San Antonio Living, SA Live, Daytime with Kimberly and Esteban, a Great Day SA and Despierta are a few of them. Um, those are the on the major networks and Univision. Um, it really provides opportunities to talk about what's going on in the community, whereas the different uh, newscasts would typically just have hard news and you know and human interest stories, and then of course your weather and sports. The lifestyle shows will allow folks to talk about a little bit more um, of the, the lighter news or the fun community news or what's going on, as you can see in these segments, what's going on around town. Um, so you want to be choosy about where you would like your segment to go. Do you want to tell a story about um, a volunteer who has made a difference? Maybe that's something that you can actually take to hard news because you can tie it to San Antonio and to the community and to the impact that will, it will have um, or that they have had on the economy. Um, if you're doing a general event um, type of pitch, you're going to want to go to the producer or a reporter from one of the, or a host of one of the lifestyle shows. Uh, some different examples about stories that you can share and tell in order to get the most out of your event coverage. Uh, one is, I'm going to speak a little bit about the, the Jimenez Thanksgiving dinner that we work with as an example. It was one of the more recent events that we've done that really has a good, uh, is a good example of, of different perspectives and angles that you can take. The first is the organizer story. So who's putting on the event? What is their tie to the event? So Patricia Jimenez, who's the daughter of Raul Jimenez, who puts on, who founded the Jimenez Thanksgiving dinner. She has a great story of how she's carrying on her father's legacy. Her mom is still alive and still participates uh, with the dinner. Her dad passed away a number of years ago, so it is his story that's continuously shared. But this past year, we shared both Patricia's story and that of um, Raul's wife, Mary, and just how they have um, carried on the tradition, passed on the legacy, and are really being a valiant part of the community and how they they told the story his story and how, how much the dinner has grown but from a familial purview so it really had a great insight on something that's become a staple of san antonio you can also just tell the general event stories you know the information about the event um for this one it was that twenty five thousand people are being fed dinner on thanksgiving day and it's the biggest event of its kind in the nation so those are the, the general pieces of information. Um, but because of the, the type of event that it is and because of the impact that it has, and there, it, you don't have to be serving 25,000 people in order for your event to have impact. So if you're impacting 20 people, that's still wonderful. You just have to share the information of how it will impact 
um, in order to, to get that story across. I mean, you can also share volunteer stories. We had a volunteer who had been a part of the dinner for all uh, 35 years at the time of its existence. Um, and he did a story about um, his delivery of ice to all of the different parts of the um, the dinner. And, you know, it was a small thing that um, became a very big thing over time. So um, his dedication and his service to, to the community was something that uh, we highlighted and we felt was important. And while serving ice may not seem like a big deal, it's delivering happiness to a lot of people on Thanksgiving Day, and he was a part of it. So think about your stories. Um, think about your volunteers who have been there for a while and uh, or who it may have deeper meaning to or who may have more connections that you can share within your pitching. Um, think about the little things and how they make the big things happen because that's really that really is significant. It really helps to tell the story. Um, you can tell stories of the guests. So again, from the dinner purview, we're talking about people who have um, maybe someone who has uh, uh, lost the patriarch of their family and they started coming to the dinner um, 10 years ago and have made it a tradition ever since so that they can be together as a family and um, remember the memory of their father um, on the most thankful day of the year. Um, again, it can be any, any kind of guest story, but again, sharing the impact is one of the things that's the most important because you want it to be relatable for people. And finally, the cause story. So why are you having it? And if, if it's a fundraiser supporting something, why does that matter? Um, you know, show the people, tell their stories, make people connect, make them engage, make them understand why it matters to them. Um, answer those questions and you'll be able to create some really great pitches. Uh, reach out to, don't be afraid to reach out to every station. Don't be afraid to reach out to a reporter or a producer from each one. Um, while you don't want to blanket and just send it to meteorologists and sports reporters, if it's a fundraising effort for uh, education, then that's probably not something they're going to report on. So, so be strategic when you reach out to folks, but um, also cover your bases. And then specifically, again, please um, check out that press release writing webinar, but make sure that you're creating a press release schedule, media alerts, and sending out all of the um, information that you need to regarding your event so that all of the news outlets know the who, what, when, and where, and why. Um, they know when to cover it, and then give them a little nudge and a reminder either the day of or the day before the event so they have it back in front of their face, usually about two weeks out before the event, maybe four if it's something that you're trying to push ticket sales or something like that on so people can first know about it to buy tickets and then know about it so that media can cover it, um, but always give them that nudge the day or, or the day of or the day before with a media alert. Finally, we wanna think about partnering with um, influencers in order to create hype and excitement around the event. So social influencers are, are um, folks on social media who have basically created their own social platforms as, as a media platform and done it very successfully. So they have a very loyal following and audience or a very, very large reach. Um, you'll want to find a fitting influencer. So if we're having um, a special service to highlight and honor and pray for our volunteers in the community, you're not going to necessarily want to reach out to an influencer who um, focuses on fashion or food. Uh, you'll want to find someone who fits your brand, who fits the event, um, and who cares about the cause or the impact that you're having. Um, there are lists, or you can do a simple Google search to look up influencers or bloggers is another great term to use, social influencer bloggers in San Antonio. Um, if you're looking beyond there you can, or looking in a different market, you can look at bloggers or social influencers in Texas. And it will give you a lot of lists 
that you can consult um, to research and look up some who may be a good fit for you. Uh, creating giveaway opportunities, like Victoria had mentioned, is um, one way to entice people and get them excited about the event and the conversations about the event. Um, you can partner up with the influencer and have them post the giveaways. And maybe it's a, some swag. Um, maybe it's something related to the theme of the event. Um, maybe it's for a raffle ticket of a prize they can win at the event. Uh, and again, cross promote, promote it on your social media and also have them promote it on theirs. Um, they cannot giveaways and, and just their posting about the event and about your brand will also help to increase your likes and follows on social media and get people more people's eyes on your page where you'll be regularly posting about your events. Uh, be sure to include them, either him or her, in your social media and that you're partnering with them um, so that it's a good relationship and more people, the event information and your partnership information will become more highly visible. Um, create quality content together. So maybe have them do some videos for you, like we talked about the importance of those videos. And um, perhaps you can ask that they do an interview or something with you that they can post on their social media platforms. Uh, and then feature the, the social media influencer or the blogger at the event. So maybe have them give uh, a short presentation, not, not about their social media platforms, but have them talk about why the event is important to them, just a quick couple of minutes. Um, or you can just recognize them in the crowd uh, or audience. Or you can have them have, if you want to do something themed, have them have a, a station at the event where people can check in with them or take a picture on your social media wall uh, along with that influencer and do something fun with it. Um, be sure that you have the uh, information that you're seeking and the kind of the type of things that you want them to post. Have it a one sheet created so that you're both on the same page and can manage expectations and so that you're getting the posts that you're most interested in and they're also um, getting a return value for their participation in the event. There are a lot of different ways that you can publicize and promote. Um, it's really important that you stay on brand and stay aligned with a consistent message and have those things in place. Probably the most important thing to remember as we provide all of this information for you is that you need to come up with a, a plan that's inclusive of most all of it. Now, some areas may be more detailed than others, but um, plan in advance and include all of the different publicity elements and also think about the things that you need to do to coordinate and organize and utilize the community that you have around you um, to help to execute these community events. Um, we'll now open it up for some Q&A. And if you have any questions at all, you can type them alongside in the comments section. And you'll see our faces in just a moment. Let me get this presentation. There we go. Okay, so like Tanya said, if you have any questions that you wanna um, ask us, you can do so in the comment section. Um, if you don't want to make your comment or question public, like I said, you can always send us an email and we'd be happy to answer um, your question by that method as well. Um, if you have any suggestions as far as um, webinar topics that you're interested in learning more about, um, you can also send us an email for that. And um, we're hoping to get one of our webinars in person with you this semester around. Um, that way we can meet all of you in person before summer break. Um, but I don't see any questions as of right now. Um, 
So like I said, if, it, if you're able to watch this webinar um, after it's posted um, and you're watching it past um, us being live, you can always just send us an email. We'll be ha happy to answer your questions then. Um, as far as that goes right now, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so thank you to those who did join us. I saw we had about three or four viewers. Um, and so if you have any other questions that you'd like to ask us, feel free to send us an email and we will see you all next month. Thanks.